C. Thank you. C. How quickly I just forget. I get to talking to our father and I forget. So thank you guys for that reminder. Um, but anyway, so uh, as we start this new uh, Wednesday night Bible study, whether it's on uh, whether it's on Wednesdays or whether it's during our preaching series or whatever, are always trying to go back and forth between New Testament and Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, so that we can we can bring the full canon of Scripture together as we study the Word of God together. Um, how many have you uh, have actually never done a verse by verse study? of the book of Judges, okay? So good half of you, how about online? Okay, a few of you guys on there, I can't see some of you because you're darkened out, but um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I've noticed there's there's a lot of folks that really, because I'll tell you, it's, it's not, so we just finished up with the book of Philippians, all right? So when we think about the book of Philippians that we've been studying on Wednesday, what was the key theme in the book of Philippians? Joy, all right? Well, Judges is the total opposite of that. This, this is a, a book that it's not one that you would want to study uh, or even to do a daily devotion if you're trying to cheer yourself up. It's just not. Uh, it is in the Word of God. It gives us examples of things not to do. Uh, as you saw, I've, I've specifically given it a title of, of uh, lessons um, uh, from failures uh, because over and over again, we see the, the, the children of, of Israel uh, struggling. Now, before we did Philippians, um, who remembers the verse-by-verse -verse, uh, study that we did before Philippians? It was Joshua, right? So this is a good follow-up Old Testament-wise to Joshua because there's alignment, if you will, between um, chronologically, we're talking right after Joshua has died. Um, now, uh, how, let, me, let me just, let me start here uh, for those of you all on online. Uh, for those of you all that know anything about the book of Judges, what are some things that come to mind? It could be anything. You're not online. Okay. So somebody, did somebody say something? Anybody online know anything about the book of Judges? Uh, it, they were an odd group of people. They were just like us, right? <laughs> but yes, we're going to find that as we go through some of these stories, you're going to be going, oh my goodness, that's in the Bible? I mean, it's some of it's kind of R-rated, if you will. What, what else do you know about the book of Judges? Anybody? It's It could be depressing, right? I'm sorry, what, George? Yeah, George is going to kept, Israel kept falling and then coming back and falling and coming back. There's this cycle that basically we're going to be seeing and talking about. Um, who are some of the judges that you know that are more the more popular? Ones? All right. So we've got Samuel, who is not one of the judges. You're thinking of Samson. Samson, right? So, so Samson's one of them. Gideon. All right. Who else? Deborah. Deborah right? And so there's all these various different types of the more famous judges, if you will, that a lot of us are aware of, but there are um, a lot that they're not common, that we're going to hear names and stories about these various judges and so forth. So tonight is going to kind of be our introduction, if you will, to, to this particular book, and we'll, Lord willing, my goal is to get us through chapter one. There are handouts in the back if you didn't grab one. Everybody online, you had the opportunity to download that attachment to be able to do that. And we're going to walk through this thing. And I'm going to kind of go back and forth, if you will, between, um, uh, uh, between showing you some slides 
that will kind of add to it. Uh, that will kind of give us a little bit of an idea as we go through through that. So um, I'm getting a little background noise here. So let me. Dwayne, do you want me to? If you, if yeah, if you don't mind. I don't um, mind. I'm going to go ahead and make you the co-host. There we go. Thank you. So, so wherever the background noise is coming from. There we go. <laughs> All right. So with your handout, um, you've got introduction, which is what we're going to do tonight. And the first uh, fill in the blank, if you will, there is uh, background for the book of Judges, a little bit of background. Um, it starts off with a transition from the book of Joshua. Uh, if, for those of you all that were involved in our study in the book of Joshua, what were, what were some of the key things that Joshua was all about? Conquering the land, conquering the land chronologically when? Yes, sir. So they had been wandering around in the desert with Charlton Heston, and they're all out there doing their thing. And then they're finally able to go into the promised land. The only two that were part of that generation that basically were allowed were who? Joshua and Caleb that were able to go into it. <laughs> most of most of all of Joshua is, is record, if you will, of conquering, going into the land of Canaan, um, and then we had some highlights along the way of like Jericho and AI and all these various different type things. Uh, but basically, it's mostly a record, of, if you will, of going into the promised land that God had given them. And then it gives us record, not only of them conquering all these various cities and so forth, but it also gives us record of, of instructions that God had given them. Uh, how they were going to divvy up the land. So once they went in there and conquered these uh, primary areas, um, they were uh, uh, broken down by tribes and they all had specific areas in the promised land. Now, if there was one thing that you could come away with that they did not do, what would that be? Right. In other words, they didn't conquer every single place that God had instructed them to, or they did not completely destroy that God had required. Well, guess what? It's coming back to bite them. In fact, it will always come back to bite them all the way up to this period of time that we live in today. Um, <clears throat> so, We've, we've got this transition from the book of Joshua. When Joshua ends, um, we've got uh, his death. Um, and so we're migrating from Joshua to the book of Judges. And it provides us this perfect segue, if you will, into studying this book of Judges. So when the children of Israel entered into the land of Canaan to conquer it, uh, at the beginning of the book of Joshua, they were very zealous for the Lord because you had this new generation um, and they were, uh, um, you know, not perfect, but basically all their, their parents, if you will, had died off, the ones that were, that were fearful to go into the land. And so God said, okay, well, you know what? You're not going to trust me. You're not going to be able to go in. The next generation will be able to, being led by Joshua. Um, and uh, so they're zealous. They're going in there, and they're very conscious that they needed to be very careful to follow all of the Lord's commandments. And in general, they had. They learned very early on that uh, who remembers the story out of Joshua that after they conquered Jericho, um, what happened that gave them this defeat? Anybody remember that story? They tried to take on another city without God's blessings ahead of time. 
it, 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 yes, it, it was kind of a dual thing, right, Miss Debbie? So in other words, it was, they had gotten cocky because it's like, oh, well, we just conquered Jericho and God did this great miracle. This next city AI is this little itty bitty thing. And then, so they go and they get, basically got their heinies kicked by this group of people thinking they could go in there with only a few people, but it wasn't so much that they went in there with a few people. What was the problem? There was sin in the camp. There was this guy by the name of Achan or Achan, as some people would call him, that basically took of the plunder from Jericho when God very specifically says, no, you're not to do that. And, and so they were whining and complaining of not wondering why didn't God give him that. And God says, you got a problem. There's sin in the camp. They dealt with it. And then God finally gave them the victory. So along the way, they pretty much had a good bout for about seven years as they were going into and conquering all these various lands. Um, and that problem there after Jericho was uh, one of the major issues. So after seven years, the stronghold cities throughout the land of Canaan, which again, from uh, an understanding, sometimes it could be a little confusing when you hear the word Canaan, Canaanites and so forth. Canaanites is basically just a generic term of everybody who lived in that land. It consisted of the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the, 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 the Philistines, all of these various types of groups were considered globally Canaanites. And so they had these stronghold cities. Then the children of Israel looked uh, to the Lord uh, to, to, to give each of the tribes the piece of territory that was to be their inheritance. The tribes of Reuben, the Gab, and the half uh, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh were able to, they wanted their land on, who can remember when we studied Joshua? Where did they want their land? On, on the, up, on, not on the west side, on the east side, right? In other words, back between Egypt or, or Sinai in that area, over to where uh, the, the Jericho River was. And so they stayed there and then God had them basically promised Moses once they went into the land, yes, you can stay here, but the men of war must go over to the west side, if you will, on the other side of Jordan to be able to help their brothers to be able to conquer the land. Once that's done and they're at peace and rest, then they can go back. And that's what, that's what they did. Now I'm sharing all this to remind us of where we are. Keep in mind, there is not a whole lot of time between once they get settled in the land to where we're getting ready to read in the book of, of Judges. Uh, it doesn't take long for them to mess up. Um, when, the, when each tribe had finally had its own allotment, uh, each of the tribes went immediately uh, go and get rid of their individual territory of all the remaining enemies in the land that were in it. That was what they were supposed to do. There were some one-offs and some things that they just never dealt with, and they were supposed to take care of that. However, the book of Joshua tells us that these tribes became apathetic and indifferent about receiving their individual territory, and they procrastinated from going and conquering the enemies within their lands. That's why Joshua has this final farewell to them and goes, look, you guys are at risk. You know, you're going to be here in the land, and uh, you haven't taken care of all of these things. You're at risk of being able to of intermarrying with these people and, and getting and turning away from the Lord our God. And that's when he says, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And so that was all. He already saw the beginnings of this apathy and so forth. And wrongly, the tribes felt that now that the stronghold cities had been conquered, uh, it was now time for them just to be able to sit back and relax. That was the last thing they should have done. None of the tribes of Israel conquered all the tribes within their territory. And a few tribes even made any kind of an effort to even didn't make any to even conquer the other ones at all. They just got lazy. And so the tribes of Israel were content to allowing the enemy to have a stronghold in their territories. If you remember, there was a couple instances to where they go, well, listen, hey, listen, you don't have to kill us. 
will become your what? Your servants, right? Well, sure enough, those servants became an issue uh, long term. Um, the book of Judges now picks up the history of Israel just after the periods documented in the book of Joshua. Now, the next fill in your blank there is the nation was to be a monarchy under God. In other words, that was God's ultimate intention. It was to be a monarchy under God. The Lord, um, here's the interesting thing. After, after uh, Moses died, what did God do to help the people to be united? And I'll give you a hint. He gave them Joshua, right? Gave them Joshua. Thank you for reading my mind, right? Gave them Joshua. In other words, he specifically appointed a leader. So you have Moses, now you have Joshua. God did not give them a specific leader because his intent was for him to rule. In other words, that he would guide and direct them personally. So um, uh, the result of doing this was, though, instead of every looking to God and worshiping the Lord as their God and king, because if you remember, they had settled now, they had the tabernacle, which would have been the central part for them to be able to continue to worship. They still had the priesthood all of these different type of things to, to gain knowledge and to gain direction from God, but they already started pulling away from that. And so we're going to see here what God does to be able to get them out of this mess that they found, find themselves at. And so they wandered every which way, and thus we found a uh, few places in the book of Judges one specific place, very familiar, is found in Judges chapter 17, verse 6. You don't need to, to turn there, I'll tell you. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Who knows what the next statement is? Well, they did eventually ask for a king, but say, say that everyone did what was right in his own eyes, right? There's three places in the book of Judges that it mentions that. So in other words, they had no king and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, we know that there are problems when we do things in our own, in our own eyes, right? So um, that's what God's intention was. So the next fill in the blank is, is what, if a, what is a judge? What is the very, very, very first thing you think of when you hear the word judge? Judge Judy, right? In other words, you, you picture usually somebody that's in a, in a big chair, it's got a gavel, dark robe, whatever. Well, I think you guys know this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to validate it. That's not what we're talking about. In other words, these judges that God raised was not a term like you would normally think of a judge. Um, it's that term, specifically judge, is used numerous times in this book. Uh, to refer to men and women who were used by God within the tribes of Israel. Um, and in Judges chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. In other words, these were people that God used to deliver his people out of the problems that they were creating for themselves. Um, so uh, the judges in Israel were, were really, they were deliverers. You could just think of it in those terms. They were deliverers of the people who would be used to help them rally together to overthrow their oppressors. Now, one of the more famous ones that we know is Samson, right? He was a judge. He was appointed by God to be a deliverer for the people, primarily against which people? The Philistines, right? How, how, how great did he do? Uh, do what? He flopped, right? In other words, he did not do, do well at all. Miss Delilah just 
caused all kinds of problems, but it was really his fault. But he was one of these deliverers. Um, they would, these judges, however, would also judge between civil matters for the people and therefore were in a sense your t traditional type of judge that you would think of because God needed to establish. Prior to that, you had Moses and Joshua and these tribes of, of leadership. Here's the point. They had every opportunity to be able to do that within their tribal lead leaders. They could have, that could have connected with the priesthood to seek God's face, but they didn't. And that's what caused the problems. Um, now, these judges were not recognized universally by all the tribes of Israel. And there may have been more than one judge functioning concurrently for, in Israel at different times. There was some overlap. The events in the book of Josh, Judges, this is important to remember, are not necessarily always chronological. So they're kind of, they're stories within this, within this. Some of it's chronological, but in general, there's some overlapping of stories and so forth. The next thing is the authorship. Who wrote this? It was Judge Judy. Judge Judy is the one, no. We don't know. Now, I know you guys are Bible scholars. Most align with someone who wrote most of it. Who would have been after, uh, right at the time of, of David and Saul and so forth, who was a prophet? Samuel, Samuel right? Most believe that Samuel wrote most, if not all, of these of the record of all of these judges. Now, he would not have been an eyewitness to all of it because it took place close to a 400-year period, all right? Um, now, uh, I want to go back, and I want to share my screen here to show you uh, these where these judges were. Um, It might be hard for the people here in the house to be able to see, but, um, oh, let me get that out of the way. Hold, please. Has that been up there the whole time? No. All right. The little thing ever since this meeting is being recorded? I'll be right back so I can get that out of the way. squares in there for you guys that are in the house here. Um, those are the various areas, all these little places. So it's hard for again here in the house to see. Down here on the bottom in the south there um, is uh, Othniel. How many here has ever heard of Judge Othniel? All right, well, he's in, he's in the Bible. How about Ibzon? Anybody heard of Judge Isbon? Ibzon? Um, Ahud. How about Deborah? Yeah, everybody's heard of Deborah. Abdon over here. Over here to the over here to the east, we have uh, Jephthah. Some people may have heard of Judge Jephthah. Then we have Tola, and then right up in here um, is Gideon. That was the area to where he was. Uh, Jer, Elon, Barak, and Shamgar. So these are all of these judges that are all mentioned in the book of, of Judges. <clears throat> we'll come back to sharing here in just a moment. Um, come back over here. There we go. All right. So these judges uh, are these deliverers, and that's kind of where they were spread out all over Israel over a period of 400 years. They did not need to be concurrent judging these things. And we're going to see in a reason why in just a moment, but they would help them um, rally together. Uh, so the author, as I said, most believe it was Samuel, but nobody can be dogmatic about it. And then the period of history covered um, was, like I said, about anywhere from three to 400 years. Uh, if you could think of a 
chronological timeline, which I'm going to show you in, in, uh, in just a moment, but from what you guys know of your Bible history, so this was Joshua, was previous chronological. Then we had the time of the judges, which was about three to 400 years. What would be the next major chunk of time that we would have? The kings, right? Starting off with Saul and then King David and then Solomon and so forth. So that kind of gives you an idea. It is anywhere around, somewhere around, starting around 1400 uh, BC. So from 1400 to about 1000-ish, somewhere in there, um, uh, is, uh, is when this period of time uh, would go. And it's about a third of the history of God's chosen people that's covered in the Old, in the Old Testament. Now, if there's anything that we can gain out of this, this next fill in the blank on your thing is encouragement from the book of Judges. Encouragement from the book of Judges. Um, what we're going to see is problems, not only in the world at that time, but specifically, this is focused on the nation of Israel. I think that we will see, just like any given time, we're just seeing pictures of God's people. I mean, George uh, had mentioned earlier about this cycle that we're going to see that I'll show you in just a moment. This, this cycle that God's people go through is very much like today. Um, just like today or just like then, people today are, are doing what's right in their own eyes. Obedience to God is usually half-hearted at best. And when that happens, chaos reigns. Um, but we can be encouraged and learn a lot from this book. In other words, that's why I titled it the way I did is because, you know, the Bible tells us that they were all what we have in there are given to us as examples. Here's another thing to me that really validates the, uh, the, the truth of the word of God. If you were writing a book and you wanted everybody to know about your chosen people and all of these things, would you have put half the stuff in the Bible that is in the Bible? No. Why? Yeah, it makes people look bad. It's embarrassing. It, 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 it shows the underbelly, if you will, of, of God's people. I mean, even in the New Testament, as we're going through First and Second Corinthians, right? We, we see these things. I mean, it just validates. This is what God wanted in his holy written word uh, for, for us to be able to know. Well, we, we learn so much from these things. Um, and here's the key. When you listen to God and you're obedient, then God will protect, bless, all of those different type things. Uh, when you're disobedient, there are consequences. That's really it in a nutshell. And I know sometimes I don't always learn that way. Uh, when I live in apathy uh, and I get rebellious and all those different type things, we're going to see over and over again. Now, the next thing is, um, is this continuous, next fill in the blank, cycles in the book of Judges. Um, in the book of Judges, we will see over and over again this regular cycle of the people of God falling away from the Lord uh, in apostasy. Then, after a period of doing that, guess what happens? Problems start coming, right? And then after problems start coming, they get oppressed and attacked by their enemies. And then now, now the heat is on. So what does God's people do when the heat's on? You come crying out to God, right? And then what does God do? He intervenes and he comes in and he solves the issues and people start becoming, you know, a contrite heart and, and, and so forth. And God in his mercy does that. And over a period of time, when God continues to pour out mercy on us, what happens? We start to become, right? Yeah, we 
apathetic, you know, all these various different type things that starts going. And then we start this cycle all over again, over and over and over again. Well, that's exactly um, what happens. So let me show you here kind of the cycle uh, that we can wrap our, our heads around uh, here on the screen. And hopefully you guys can see that. So, all right, so we'll start, um, we'll start up here in the top at about one o'clock, all right? Peace and prosperity, woohoo, right? And then apathy and compromise, and then rebellious, rebellion and paganism in their particular case, even in today, famine, war, plagues, and slavery, and then confession and repentance, crying out to God. God hears, he saves, he intervenes and restores, and then they have peace and prosperity, and it just kind of goes over and over again. And that's what we will see over and over again. The next thing I want to do, too, is I want to show you the timeline that I put, gave you on page two, on the back side of, of your handout, that kind of give you an idea here of, of uh, where, where we're talking about. If you look at about um, 2100 BC, uh, there in the middle, you've got the time of Abraham. Now this is the history, if you will, of Israel. Um, it was the nation's birth in infancy. And then at about 1900 BC, uh, you have Joseph that comes, and then you have, after Joseph, right, they all go to Egypt, the family goes there, the 12 tribes, uh, which are the sons of Jacob, Jacob's other name is what? Israel, and they have this 400, it's interesting, there's always this about 400 years, right, of bondage that eventually takes place in Egypt, and then uh, at around 1500 is when Moses shows up. Uh, and then we have the exodus and, interest, uh, and entrance over this, this 100 year period uh, to where Joshua uh, 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 finally comes, well, not, he's not 100 years in there, but basically once they leave and wandering out 40 years, and then all the other periods. So we've got this period of time in there. The whole time there, that's where we have the Pentateuch, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They weren't written at that particular time. In other words, that's the areas, the timing that it, that it uh, covers. And then, as you can see, Judges there at about 1400. And that's that about that 400-year period in there. And then at about 1000 BC is to where we have the kings. We have Samson's kind of the last of the of the judges, and then Saul, the first king, uh, and then we get into uh, the prophets, the poets, and so forth. Um, Isaiah uh, comes on the scene uh, and is a prophet because we know that over this, uh, from a thousand till about 700, after uh, David was king, and then after David, who was the king after David? Solomon, so stay with me here. So then Solomon, well, what happened during the king of the kingship of Solomon that started problems started coming? He well, he took a lot of wives, right? Seven hundred of those puppies, and and uh, and a lot of mother-in-laws, and all of those those different type things. And they started he started following false gods and so forth. Well, eventually the kingdom broke up, right? We had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and the northern up close into what we would know as modern or then modern day Assyria, uh, and then we had Judah to the south, two tribes down there. Well, eventually, what happened? What happened after a period of time when you had the the the, the northern and the southern tribes? It's on there. It tells you there's a little word there after kings. They went into exile, the captivity, right? That's when the Assyrians came in, and this was God's judgment on their people. And so, and then after the Assyrians, you had the 
the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. So all of that, and then they were restored again. Uh, and then there was this 400, here's this 400 years again of silent years, and then Christ comes. So that's kind of the, all the way up to Christ is the history, if you will, all on this one slide. Well, you can see right smack in the middle here is about this 400 year period of this time of the judges. And um, the, uh, that is, uh, uh, this whole book here gives us a very, very dark side of, of Israel's history. Now, I've also given you um, the, the, the overall outline. Uh, this time, instead, I've, I liked, uh, I always look for outlines and ones that I like the best, and it's just preference. This one's actually one that MacArthur's put together. Uh, I like that gives us a breakdown. So as we go through this book, we'll be using this outline. Um, now this morning or this evening, uh, as we go through chapter one, um, it is this introduction and summary, the disobedience of Israel, which starts in chapter one and goes all the way through chapter three, verse six. We're only going to look at chapter one tonight. So that's kind of a lot, but kind of high level, if you will, uh, for uh, now as we get into the verse, verse by verse, looking at this. Before we get into the verse by verse, what comments or questions do you have? Oh, yeah. So in other words, the last good question. So the question was, what's those 400 silent years? The very last book of the Old Testament, which is what? Malachi, right? Malachi was the last of the prophets. The, he was called, called a minor prophet only because it was a shorter book. There was no other voice from God until Jesus shows up on the scene. And that's why they call it the silent years. So great question. Um, now, so let's go into Judges chapter 1. And in J Joshua, I'm in the wrong book. He's got judges. So the um, we're going to see in chapter one, verses one through thirty-six, this incomplete conquest that's already there on your outline over the Canaanites. Now, in verses one through three, let's read through these and. And uh, we'll, we'll talk, talk it through as we learn here what's happening. It says, after the death of Joshua. So from a chronological standpoint, this is, this is where they are. Now, if you look over to chapter 2, just very quickly, you may have a, 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 a heading starting in verse 6 that says the death of Joshua. It's like, well, wait a minute. What, why, why is this? Well, the first two chapters here, if you will, of the book of Judges is more of an overview. So there's some little bit of an overlap between starting off right here at the book of Judges, talking about after the death of Joshua, and then it reiterates it again in chapter two. So just, just a little heads up there. So it says, after the death of Joshua, verse one, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord and says, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I had given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. Well, just in those first little three things, we can get a lot of stuff here out of the book of Judges. At first glance, um, it may appear that the children of Israel in these verses are being zealous and vigilant before the Lord as they seek to go out now and to continue on after Joshua has died and take possession of the tribe's allotted territories. However, um, they only serve the Lord, as we'll see here 
going on, just kind of only half-heartedly along the way. Um, it says here, here's the interesting thing. It says that they inquired of the Lord. Uh, how did they do that? Before they had Joshua or Moses. Anybody have any thoughts? They, they did, thank you. And, and so uh, before they would have gone through Joshua or, or, or Moses, and then these leaders, these other tribe leaders and so forth would communicate from them. Now, here's the reason, this is a trick question. We don't know, but we do know based on uh, a tool that they had available to them that would give them yes and no answers. All right, Bible scholars, who remembers what that was? It was kind of like casting lots, but the priesthood had this little pocket that they had what they think were two things because it has two names. How many here remembers what the two names of this little way of discerning the, the, the mind of God? The Urim and Thummim. The, the Urim and Thummim. You guys remember the Urim and Thummim? And I like to say that because it sounds like I'm lisping, but it's the Urim and Thummim. We don't know what it was. It basically means lights and the words mean lights and something else. Some think it was kind of like maybe kind of a yes, no, black, white type of thing that God had established as a way to be able to discern his mind. They would use this Urim and Thummim. So that's possible. That's in other words, hey, God, how do you want us to, to go? All right, do you want us to go and conquer the land? Urim and Thummim, yes. Okay, uh, who do you want to go first? Uh, do you want the, the tribe of, of Reuben to go first? No. Uh, do, you, do you want um, uh, the, the tribe of Judah? Yes. I don't know. Somehow, some way, God communicated to them to let them know that they were to go uh, do it. So we'll assume that they may have used the Urim and the Thummim to be able to do that. Um, but they went into, they wanted to find out which areas of the territory to conquer first. And, um, but here's, here's, the, here's the thing. I, this is, if you're not careful, you'll miss this little nuance. And I can't be dogmatic about that. It says, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Look in verse two. It says, the Lord said, who? Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Now, what do you notice there in verse three? They went and got somebody else to go with them too. Um, so it, I heard Miss Marilyn say that. What'd you, what'd you say? He wants help. So who does he go to? He goes to his brother's tribe, right? I mean, that tribe, the Simeon. So in other words, God, who do you, who do you want to do this? Judah. All right. Judah goes, all right. Who's here to help me? If you're not careful, we can miss that very small nuance that already gives us a little bit of an indication here, because if God said, I want you to do that, and they're reaching out now to another tribe to be able to help them, what are they saying? We don't trust God. God's already said, I want Judah to go. So just right out of the bat, but God was gracious. And look here in verses four through seven, uh, uh, then Judah, verse 4, went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek, and they found uh, Adonai Bezek at Bezek, and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the 
parasites. Now, this would have been like the king, if you will, of this area. Uh, and look here what he did in verse 6. It says, And Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him, and they caught him. And what did you notice they did? They cut off his thumbs and his big toes. That's weird. Uh, verse 7, And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. So here's the thing. So we think that's really weird, all right? In a way, it kind of is. All right, and there's all kinds of stories in Judges like this, some of the weird stuff that we're going to read. They cut off, they, so they, they, they excuse me, they, they, they cut off his thumbs. Why? Why would they do that? Were they, were they doing it just to be um, a method of just cruelty to be able to do that? Right. So in other words, you know, you, if you, you can't use a sword if you're thumbless because you're no longer thumbbody. Sorry, I had to go there. All right. In other words, it would have been a way, you, if you've got a footnote probably somewhere in your Bibles, it probably tells something like that. It would be a way for them to be able to not fight anymore. And if you and if you had your your big toes cut off, what does that do to you? Imbalanced. Yeah. It's I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, you imbalanced. become imbalanced, right? So, in other words, it was a way of kind of decapitating. Now, if you guys remember when we studied the book of Joshua, what was one of the things that they had done to keep them from having strength? to the horses. You remember what they did? The hamstring, hamstrung, hamstringed, hamstrung the horses because that was their strength. And so it's the same principle. And if you'll notice here, this king, basically he's going, look, I did the same thing. He says, in fact, and it's almost kind of like he's boasting. It's, he's like going, look, I've done this to 70, uh, uh, to 70 kings and their thumbs and their big toes and I had them pick up scraps underneath my, my basically he's kind of boasting here. But it's interesting, though, he also is showing a little level of humility. And he goes, so God is just repaying me, right? So it's interesting here. But that's what they did. Um, it's, it's pretty weird, but I, I, I don't know. If maybe we should bring that back as a way of, anyway, no, I'm kidding. Um, and then in verse 8 through 10, uh, Judah captures Jerusalem and then begins to fight against the rest of the Canaanites. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and, and stuck it uh, and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterwards, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country, in the Negev, and in the lowlands. So in other words, if you could picture... Israel again. Um, this is to the south, the Negev. Here's, here's a good way of thinking of Israel. Running north and south through Israel, you have this mountainous range that kind of goes all through the center of it. Um, and you've got lowlands like, like you would have in area, uh, any other area. You've got uh, as more like foothills and stuff up to the north, up into Galilee and so forth. As you get closer to the to Jerusalem, and as you go through uh, close to around the Dead Sea, which is way way down on the west side of all of this, is way down south. Well, down to the further south, there's this thing called the Negev, and it is it is nothing but but pure desert. That's all all down to the south down there. And this is the area here that's that's described. It says, to the hill country in the Negev and in the lowland, in verse 10, and Judah went up against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now, the name of Hebron was formerly uh, Kirithaba, and they defeated Sheshai and Ahiman and Talmai. So, in other words, Judah captures Jerusalem. Um, and so it wasn't all doom and gloom for, for the tribe of Judah as we see that they did have several victories. However, in comparison to the entire land that they were given as an inheritance, there was still a lot of land that they didn't conquer. 
and they should have done a lot more because it's going to come back and bite them later. Um, the tribe of Judah would now have to live with the enemies they had fought, that they had allowed to have a foothold in their land. And at time, it would be to their undoing. So we're reading this and we're going, oh, wow, way to go, Judah. But if you go back and you look at all the land that God had given them and what they were supposed to conquer and get rid of, they didn't get rid of all of them. Now, in verses 11 through 15, the story is recounted of the victory of Othniel, who is the, who is the nephew of Caleb, which he fought in order to give Caleb daughters uh, Asher for a wife. Joshua told this same story in Joshua chapter 15. But as we look here in verses 11 through 15, we see this story again. It says, from there, they went against the inhabitants of Debir, and the name of Debir was formerly Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, he, so let's stop there just a moment, if you remember. What was, what was the significant thing about Caleb? Yeah, Caleb said, give me that mountain. In other words, it was only Joshua and Caleb were, who were the only remaining members of the first 12 spies, 40 some years, 50, 60 years now, prior to all of that, that had um, gone into uh, the land that was still alive. And God had promised Caleb that he could have a portion of land. And here he was in his 80s. And he says, I want that mountain. And here's this guy that that is ready to still conquer and so he asks for help god allows him to have the help to be able to conquer what he was able to because he's not a whole tribe in himself and so he says um caleb said verse 12 he who attacks kiriath sefer and captures it i will give him actually my daughter for a wife and othniel the son of kenna's caleb's younger brother captured it and he gave him Ashketh, his daughter for a wife and when she came to him she urged him to ask her father for a field and she dismounted from her donkey and caleb said to her what do you want and she said to him give me a blessing since you have set me in the land of the negev down south i also need water all right like i just said that's that's down there that's all um uh, uh desert area down there she also give me springs of water and caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs now let's let's just stop here just a moment here um and think about how this all works again this is all part of learning the bible and all these different type things um from a from a western culture type thing um what is odd to us in this whole situation All right, so yeah, giving your daughter away is like, if you capture her, you can have my daughter. Well, if in our culture, for a daughter, how would that make you feel? It's like, I don't, I don't want him or, or whatever the case may be. Well, again, from a cultural perspective, first of all, women in, in that day really just didn't have a lot of rights, if you will. Um, but it was an honor for as soon as the, the daughter was ready to be of age of marriage, it was arranged. And um, how many here has heard of a dowry, right? What's a dowry? Okay, that's what, it, it's stuff that you have. Who pays the dowry? The wife's. The wife, but specifically, would the wife to be do it, or who's doing the arranging? the The father of the wife to be, he would pay up the dowry, if you will, and give it to the the the, the father of. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the other way around. I'm sorry, wait a minute. It would be the dowry would have been given to let me get my let me get my story straight uh it's basically in case it doesn't work out that the the dowry would be as a way for the the 
Let me get my the groom's family, right, to be able, if it didn't work out, that the daughter would still be able to be taken back and she'd be taken care of, all right? Now, in this particular case, what's happening is, is that Caleb is offering his daughter if they're able to help with this land. And so basically, that's just, it was the culture of that particular time. And so he gives his daughter away and she says, hey, listen, thank you for the land, Pops but it's kind of dry down here. I need something here to be able to do it. And so uh, she comes to him and asks him and he gives the blessing of these springs of water down there to the south. So just a little side, side thing on there. Um, and then in verses 16 through 20, uh, the Kenites, again, we have this group of people, which is the family of Moses's father-in-law were given a land in Judah, and Simeon and Judah conquered the Canaanites in Zephath, in the city of Hormah, Simeon's possession, and Judah took Gaza and Ekron. Let's, let's read this story here in verses 16 through 20. It says, and the descendants of the Kenite. Um, does anybody have um, uh, a footnote about the Kenite? Who was, who was Moses' father-in-law? I'll give you a hint. Beverly Hillbillies. Jethro, right? Um, and so Moses' father-in-law went up to the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negeb, right? That's down south near Arad. And they went and settled with the people, and Judah went with Simeon, his brother. Now, these now keep in mind, when you hear these names again, these are not single individuals. These are whole tribes, all right? I know that you know that, but you can get wrapped up, and it's like, well, wait a minute. No, we're talking the whole tribes of Judah. Uh, and Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites, who inhabited Zephath and devoted it to destruction. So the name of the city was called Horma, verse 18, Judah also captured <laughs> Gaza with its territory. Now, again, when you hear the word Gaza, we hear that still today. Where is Gaza? It's on the coast, right? So it's down down south along the coast there, little sliver, they call it the Gaza Strip. Well, who do we know? And I shared with the, you guys later on, um, when the spies went into the land and they saw this land of milk and honey and they saw these great big things of, of grapes and all these different type things, but the thing that made them fearful were who? They were giants. And these giants, these huge statured people were in Gaza. They were in that area. Now that's important because who was the famous giant? Goliath. We know 400 years later. Who? Goliath. Goliath. And Goliath was a Phil Philistine, Philistine, right? And so this is kind of that area there. It says, so Judah also captured Gaza with its territory and Ashkelon and its territory and Ekron with its territory. And the Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the, the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove them out from the three sons of Anak. Anak is the tribe that, not, not a Hebrew tribe, a Philistine tribe, that's where Goliath came from. The Anakites were these very huge groups of, of statured people. But it says that he couldn't do it because they had chariots of iron. What's the big deal here about the chariots of iron? Which, by the way, the Philistines were very well known for their ironworks. Why? What was the big deal with these chariots of iron? Oh, 
All right, so the arrows couldn't, couldn't penetrate it. In other words, it was something that was totally alien to the, the, the level of warfare that the Israelites had, and God didn't want them to have chariots and horses. Why? They put their faith and trust in that and not in God. Yeah, they put their faith and trust in the chariots and the horses and all of these things. And God continued to give them um, um, victory after victory after victory of people who had more modern weaponry. I mean, think about it. How did God help them to defeat Jericho? Uh, it was it was what? A loud noise, right? Now, if you if you've ever watched Veggie Tales, it was by by throwing milkshakes down on them, but all these different type of things. But it was it was uh, supernatural, and and in every case, they would have small groups of people to be able to defeat these all these areas. But here's the point: is that again, if we're not careful, we'll miss it. It says God was with Judah, and uh, and he took possession of the hill country. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. What does that tell us? They didn't trust God. In other words, if they had been wholehearted in trusting God to be able to go in there and, and uh, uh, defeat these people completely as God wanted, God told him, you need to take care of it. I'll be with you. But something was holding them back. And notice here, and in Hebron was given to Caleb, um, look here in verse 21. Um, but the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. In other words, to the day that this was written, 400 years later, when all of this stuff, there's problems there in that area. And again, it's not complete obedience. And that's what happens when there's not complete obedience. Was it called Jerusalem before they got there? Yes, it was called Jerusalem. Yes, which is, is interesting because uh, what does that mean? City, Jeru, Jeru means city. And what does Salem or Shalom mean? Peace, Jeru Shalom. It, it's city of peace. It's never been a city of peace. It will never ever be until the Prince of Peace comes and, and sets that up. So yes, good question. It was it was called that even back to that to that day. Now all the way now all the way from chapter twenty one. I'm sorry, verse twenty one, all the way to the end of verse thirty six. Um, uh, is the lands not conquered by the tribes of Israel? And so just allow me, if you will, to read through this, and we'll wrap up tonight in chapter 1. Uh, we just read um, in verse 21, but the people of Benjamin didn't drive them out, and they're there to that day. Verse 22, the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them, and the house of Joseph scouted out Bethel. Now, the name of the city was formerly Luz, and the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, please show us the way into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. And he showed them the way into the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and his, all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites and built a city, and it called its name Luz. That is the name to this day. That one's going to be a problem eventually <laughs> going, going on. Uh, which, by the way, when you would think that when the cities back in those days, they had these big walls that was usually built around them, um, and they would have a gate. Why would they ask the way into the city? It was most likely they were looking for the other way in. In other words, the kind of the secret entrance to be able to get, because if they went right through the front door to be able to conquer them, they're going to get caught. So that's, it's, it's, it, it struck me as like, why, why would they be asking this guy 
uh, to be able to how to get into there when they would have the gates. Now look in verse 27, and we'll just read here the narrative through verse 36. Now my Bible has a little heading that says failure to complete the conquest. Uh, if you have an ESV, it probably says the same thing or any other translation um, is very similar. It is the failure to complete what God had said. Verse 27, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bethshane and its villages, which by the way, Bethshane is an incredible area. Um, a very, very cool place. Uh, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. In other words, we don't want to go. Well, you need to go because we're going to conquer. Well, they just didn't do what God had asked them to do. Verse 28, when Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. And Ephraim, verse 29, did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. These are these little key critical things that if you can even write underline among them, they didn't drive them out. Verse 30, Zebulon did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalo. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. Well, that's not what God wanted. Verse 31, here's another tribe. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Acho, or the inhabitants, you notice how I put the when you see it, I like to do that. Um, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or of uh, Alab, or Achzib, or Helbah, or of Aphek, or of Rehob, so the Asherites, verse 32, lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, where they did not drive them out. In other words, this whole time, they're living among them. It's not like they didn't conquer them and like completely destroy them. No, it's like they just lived among them, and it's catching up with them. Verse 33, Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemeth or the inhabitants of Bethana. They were, in other words, we just saw that before. They were they were overlapping. That's why they're these two tribes overlap. So they uh, were close to each other. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemeth or Bethana became subject to forced labor for them. Verse thirty four, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back. So Dan is the Hebrew tribe. The Amorites are a Canaanite tribe, pressed the people of Dan back to the hill country for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. God said, it's your land. They're going, we're not going to let you do it. So they listened to him. Verse 35, the Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Harris in uh, Aijalon and the Shalbium, but the ha hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily on them and they became subject to forced labor and the border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of uh, Akrabim from Selah and upward. In other words, it's a very large area. So there's chapter one. We're just getting started. We see the very, very beginnings that after chapter two is you're gonna have to see because of their disobedience, why God's gonna have to call these, um, these judges to be able to help them to get out of the mess that they're in because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. In fact, if you'll notice, um, uh, well, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. I started to read in, in chapter two. Go ahead and read the rest of chapter two so you'll be ready in your head next week. Uh, but this we're going to find um, is a very, very dark period in their history. And in chapter 2, verse 16, it says, well, let me, let me look here in chapter 2, verse 14. This will set the stage for next week. Um, Judges chapter 2, verse 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. That's not a word we hear very often, plunder, but we know what that means. 
and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them and they were in terrible distress. Man, I don't want to compare necessarily um, uh, to, we don't believe in replacement theology, but if you think about our nation right now, it's a nation that we founded under God, if you will, far from ever really being a completely Christian nation, but we've trusted in God. We've seen over 200 years now, finally, where God is just doing the same thing. He's just taking his hand off of them and allowing these things to happen. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, and it says, the Lord was against them for harm as the Lord had warned and the Lord had sworn to them and they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of their hand of those who plundered them. Notice in verse 17, yet they did not listen to their judges for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. And they soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord and they did not do so. And we're going to see this pattern over and over and over again um, uh, as we go through this. Okay, I could ramble on and on. There's so much in here. Uh, any thoughts, anybody online, any comments, any questions? Unmute uh, yourself if you do. All right. Anybody in the house? Did anything I say make sense tonight? A little bit? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to turn you guys around so that everybody can kind of see each other. You can see the people that are afraid to show their faces, but we at least see their names. Let's, let's go to Father in prayer. Lord, we love you, and thank you, God. Thank you for these dear people that chose to be here tonight that chose to be online, to be here uh, on premises, God, and thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for the privilege of being able to study your word together. Uh, Lord, I, I wish um, we could spend hours and hours going through your word, and there's just so much that's here, but Lord, thank you for the time that we do have together, and Lord, I, I pray that uh, you will help me, God, to be um, uh, to be able to teach this with accuracy, fail, forgive me in areas to where uh, I, I, I don't, but Lord, you know my heart and the study, Lord, to be able to help us to be able to understand from your word what you've got. And we see these stories over and over and over again, uh, Lord, through this book of Judges, and may we learn from them, not to be able to just to have head knowledge of what happened in the history of Israel, but God, that we can learn lessons from the failures that they had. Thank you for your grace, because we see your grace over and over again. Uh, we just pray for your blessings as we leave this place, and uh, Lord, ask for you your favor upon us. And give us opportunities to share Christ every moment that we have. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah. All righty. All right, beautiful people. God bless you. Love you. Have a wonderful evening. Good to see you back. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.